Hello and welcome to the fifth player education video for Pillars of Salt. As before, if you're new to this channel, Pillars of Salt is an independent Vampire the Masquerade LARP operating out of Los Angeles, California, and you can find us on Facebook if you're interested. And we're producing these videos to help our players expand their knowledge of the World of Darkness and vampires in particular. While this video will no doubt be of use to Ventru players directly, even non-Ventru players can gain valuable insight into the history of the Camarilla, the history of the Kindred, and also learn about the attitudes and values which shape their allies, rivals, or even enemies. And with that, our disclaimer. This video goes into some pretty secret lore, things not even most other Ventru know about. As far as anyone knows, there is only one Hardestat, and Marcus Vitell has always been Ventru. So, when watching, keep that in mind, and when playing, also keep in mind your character's own history, lores, and experiences when deciding what you do and don't know about the Ventru. Also, while Ventru share many core values, they are not a hive mind. It is quite possible for one character to, in any number of ways, subvert, defy, or disagree with certain aspects, attitudes, or values of the clan. However, Every player who does that should know what they're getting into and what it is fair for them to expect. As long as the Ventru character adheres to the core values of the clan and maintains a respectable amount of dignitas, a certain amount of eccentricity can be forgiven. Alright, with that, let's start with the overall design themes of the Ventru. The Ventru are the clan of kings who believe in their cane given right to rule and they avidly pursue positions of leadership and the acclaim of their peers. But, as another franchise once said, with great power comes great responsibility. More than leaders, Ventru believe themselves stewards and shepherds, duty-bound to care for their flock. A good manager pushes his employees to excel, and a good Ventru similarly works to bring out the best in their vassals and underlings. In counterpoint, however, a Ventru feels no obligation to help those who would spurn them. The Ventru are obsessed with blood. Even their clan flaw, an inability to drink except from very narrow sources, reflects this. Beyond their flaw, the Ventru carefully choose their childer, often declining a perfectly viable candidate for the embrace, simply because she does not come from the proper mortal bloodline. As kindred, Ventru believe competency is carried in the blood just as firmly as clan identity. The child of a traitor or incompetent will soon make her weaknesses known, it's only a matter of time, and the child of a respected elder is granted more power and given leeway due to their lineage. History Let's start with the history of the clan itself. The name of the Ventru clan founder is not widely known, but he's sometimes called Vidartha, so we'll use that. Vidartha was not only the first child of Irad of the second generation, he was the very first third generation, specifically chosen by Cain for Irad to embrace. Vidartha would sit by Cain's side as Cain sat in judgment of other vampires, a place of favor which quickly earned him the ire of his sire and eventual broodmates. One night, Cain came to Vidartha and revealed to him that the Dark Father wished his favored grandchild to succeed him as ruler of the first city. Vidartha didn't have much time to prepare, however, as the rains of the deluge began to fall that very night, the night that Cain vanished. Vidartha, however, was cunning, and he did not seize power immediately during the second city, knowing he had no way to prove what Cain had told him. Instead, he allowed the second generation to rule as tyrant. The third generation eventually turned to Vidartha for help, which he gladly provided. After the third generation rose in rebellion against their sires, Vidartha was the acclaimed leader of the third generation. However, no vampire can long tolerate the rule of another, and Vidartha's reign fell into petty bickering and jealousy. The Ventru founder craved his grandsire's guidance, and so he left the city in search of Cain, and that was the last anyone ever openly heard of him. As the Ventru expanded, those of the fourth generation found a home in Greece, particularly the rigid martial hierarchy of Sparta. 
one who called herself Artemis, took control of the city-state. Her success with Sparta inspired other venture to come and settle the area, building up their own power bases in support of her goals. This soon brought them into conflict with the Bruja of Athens, and provoked the First Bruja War. This war was largely fought through mortal proxies, who had no idea who really pulled their strings. No kindred blood was spilled, but the conflict would set the stage for future wars between Venture and Bruja. However, after Greece came Rome, and this is when the Venture thrived. Fleeing their eventual defeat in Greece, Artemis and her child Lysander settled among the Etruscans of Italy, and set to work building up the tribe to be a force to be reckoned with. They succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Encountering the Etruscan leader Collat and his child Camilla, the Greek Ventru persuaded Camilla of some of their ideas. What happened next is shrouded in mystery. Did Collat step down willingly? Unlikely for a Ventru, but not unthinkable. Did Camilla defy his blood and destroy his sire? Unlikely, but again, not unthinkable. Camilla was to become the face of Ventru in Rome for centuries to come. Of course, nothing lasts forever, and no empire expands without eventually encountering a rival. Such was the fate of Camilla, the shadow emperor of Rome, when encountering Bruja-led Carthage. Though the mortal empires had many reasons to fight, the vampires pushed them into open war. After a series of conflicts, the Roman Ventru prevailed, though not without cost. Artemis herself was torn to pieces by frenzied Bruja, and many other respected elders lost their own lives to the fighting. What's more, the destruction of Carthage laid the groundwork for a Ventru Bruja rivalry, which persists even into the modern night. Rome continued to expand and Ventru influence with it. Many modern Ventru look to Rome as the time when their clan truly shone and hold Rome up as an example of what the Ventru can accomplish at their best. But no paradise is permanent. Stability eventually leads to stagnation, and Rome fell, giving way to the Long Night. During the Long Night, the Ventru focused on military matters, hearkening back to their Spartan roots. This was not without cause, however. The medieval nobility was reliant on a system of men-at-arms, and so any kindred who wished to accrue temporal power would of course need to get invested in the martial feudal society. Some Ventru were successful at infiltrating the church, but only nominally. Their more shadowed cousins maintained dominance over that sphere of control. However, most Ventru never lost their sense of leadership and nobility. In particular, the Ventru gained control over two territories, England and Germany. The fief of the Black Cross, ruled by Hardestadt, Prince Jürgen of Magdeburg, and Prince Julia Antasia of Frankfurt, held control of the German states, where the silence of the blood began to be practiced in earnest. And in the baronies of Avalon, Mithras ruled over many disparate clans in England, who nevertheless all owed him fealty. A small line of Ventru called the El Hijazi carved out a place for themselves in the Middle East, but, by and large, medieval Ventru confined themselves to Europe and the Near East. During the earliest nights of the Renaissance, Hardestadt and his coterie gained prominence with their ideas of unity and stability. The details of this endeavor are covered in the History of the Camarilla video, so I won't bore you and rehash those details. However, of note is that Hardestadt also took the opportunity during this time to reorganize his clan. Moving away from scale at arms, the Ventru began to establish themselves as bankers, business vampires, and money makers. This drew the contempt of their anti tribute brethren, who still adhered to the medieval values of knighthood and chivalry. This schism remains and is deep and abiding between the two bloodlines. Ventru continued to grow in power and influence up through the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries thriving in a world which prized nobility, privilege, and rulership. However, cracks began to show midway through the 1800s and the revolutions of 1848. Most of Ventru were taken completely by surprise, but managed to retain most of their holdings. However, the worst was yet to come. World War I and the following depression threw the clan into chaos as long-cultivated investments 
simply vanished overnight. The chaos was only compounded a generation later as most Ventru, who had finally made some progress in restoring their power bases, were again plunged into World War II. Emerging from the war, the Ventru found themselves in a world where the rules had been profoundly rewritten by the existence of nuclear weaponry. At first, attracted to the sort of power represented by the bomb, Savvy Ventru soon realized that no Ventru, no Hindred, should ever have access to such power. Better to leave it in the hands of the mortals. In modern nights, things are beginning to fray around the edges. The Directorate is more secretive than usual, and even Elders are beginning to grumble at this. In addition, the clan must learn how to adapt to the changing values of modernity, and a population of Childer, raised on the values of individualism, progressivism, and liberalism, who are quietly discontent with the status quo. Clan values. All right, now that we've covered history, let's move on to clan values. The most important value is stability. Ventru are suspicious of change and innovation, unless you can show them how they can make money off of it. Nine times out of ten, a Ventru will prefer to live with the certainty of a tyrant rather than the risk and uncertainty posed by revolution. Even if they're fairly certain that they might end up better than they were, most Ventru don't want to take the risk. As such, tradition, heritage, and continuity are all highly valued by the Ventru. While one might think that at first the Ventru might be attracted to embrace the famous achievers, they usually don't. Winston Churchill was a fantastic politician, and Alexander the Great a general bar none. But they both would have made horrible venture neonates, having to start over in a new society with new rules, where their mortal accomplishments only meant so much. Instead, the venture prefer to find those with potential and cultivate that. Now, let's delve a little deeper and cover dignitas, succor, and decorum. Dignitas is a nebulous, vaguely abstract concept, which nevertheless Ventru live and die by. It's the sum total of one's accomplishments and failings, a running total of respect, honor, shame, and scandal. Dignitas is a Ventru's standing within their clan, and many Ventru would rather fall on their sword and greet the dawn than face loss of their Dignitas. It is not a term which gets bandied about in casual conversation, but every Ventru knows their own dignitas and that of their clanmate. As befits their status as noble vampires, the Ventru also engage in a complicated system of fealty and obligation. Young Ventru have a liege who may or may not be their sire, and whose interests they are bound to protect. As a Ventru grows older, he begins to accrue his own vassals, who he is responsible for. Ventru, who remain outside the fealty chain for a significant period of time, are looked at askance by their clanmates, the same as any outsider. The ethic of succor is unique among the clans, and inviolable. Should a Ventru come to another and say, Cousin, I implore you, or any number of recognized phrases which mean the same thing, that Ventru is obligated by centuries of tradition to come to their aid. Neonate, rival, even sworn enemy. Ventru might fight amongst themselves like a sack full of angry cats, but they will fall in line when the time comes. The Ventru understand that fortunes rise and fall, and there is no shame in coming to a place in one's unlife where one must call upon the ethic, provided one does not abuse it. The Ventru also have their own system to resolve disputes in clan, called informally a court. Two Ventru who have come to an impasse ask a higher-ranked Ventru to adjudicate. Courts are open to all clan members, and many travel over a hundred miles to witness one. Each Ventru presents their case to the chosen arbiter, who hands down judgment after a night of contemplation. Though the decision of the arbiter is not legally binding, a Ventru who defies the ruling of a court risks seriously damaging her career and, most importantly, dignitas. One last note about Ventru values. They place institutions far above individuals. The king may die, but the kingdom persists. 
Such a value may often lead Ventru to appear cruel or heartless in the eyes of others, as the Ventru appears perfectly happy to sacrifice individual lives, or even unlives, for a particular cause. However, the Ventru believes they're serving the greater good. After all, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and if a few people need to die to preserve an institution, then so be it. Of prominent and major concern to Ventru in their night tonight is decorum. How one acts, presents oneself, and conducts business. Ventru are polite as a matter of survival, a bulwark against the beast. If an impolite remark becomes unthinkable, the larger depravity of the beast is thereby held at bay. As such, small lapses in etiquette are nearly unforgivable. Losing one's temper or control of one's emotions are seen as grave mistakes, especially if they are a regular aspect of the venture's behavior. Decisions must be made with the good of the clan in mind, and those who are thought to make their choices based on fear, rage, or lust are often looked down upon by the clan at large. Let's focus on some of the highlights of decorum. To begin with, Ventru always work to present a dignified mien to the other kindred. No Ventru would dream of showing up to court or a meeting anything less than perfectly put together. The Ventru value city titles more than clan titles. After all, the acclamation of one's peers is far more valuable. As such, defer to city titles when addressing a clanmate. Use clan titles only among Ventru, otherwise use the basic honorific. A good Ventru neither brags nor yells to get his point across. Ventru absolutely do not disagree with each other in public. They do not contradict each other, much less argue when other kindred are watching. Save that for behind closed doors. Among other kindred, Ventru present a united front. No matter how bitter the rivalry, Ventru will always publicly support each other. Neonates defer to Ancilla, and Ancilla defer to elders. Lastly, while Ventru are proud of their disciplines, they are careful not to be uncouth about them. While using a discipline against a mortal is business as usual, most of Ventru are reluctant to use their disciplines on other kindred unless absolutely necessary. Indeed, young Venture are taught that only a prince, justicar, praetor, or strategoi has the authority to request access to one's mind, and it should be for a good reason. Clan Structure Alright, now that we've covered clan values, let's delve a little deeper into the clan structure. In modern nights, some of the more traditional titles have begun to be spoken of with their more casual terms. We'll start at the top with the ephorate the approximately twelve anonymous elders who rule the clan. Most Ventru have no idea who the E4s are, but understand these ancients set clan policy and manage a vast empire of influence and finance, and adjudicate Ventru disputes which cross domain boundaries. Below the Ephorate are the Strategoi, who serve in many ways as agents of the Ephorate. Strategos usually have a geographic territory under their concern, and are roughly analogous to a Justicar as far as the clan is concerned. As opposed to E4s, every Venture knows a Stratagos when they meet one. Below the Stratagoi are the Lictors, effectively clan Archons, and tasked with the dirty work the Stratagoi wish to remain apart from. Every Lictor has a sphere of particular efficacy, and they are frequently sent to cities experiencing the sort of trouble the Lictor is suited to repair. Oddly enough, many lictors end up as princes of the domains they are sent to. Under the lictors are the tribunes. While lictors have an area of specialty, tribunes are more often generalists sent to solve any number of problems. Most tribunes downplay their role. Tribunes also function as the go-betweens from the strategoi and lictors to the venture on the ground in a particular city. Speaking of the city. Now we move to the local titles. We'll start with Praetor, who is the highest ranking Ventru in the city. Many Praetors are princes or primogen, but it's not a requirement. Praetors are responsible for providing leadership and direction to the Ventru in their city. The Praetor works with the Gerousia, also called the Board of Directors, which functions as a council of elders. 
both the praetor and primogen are by default on the board, along with any member raised by a vote of the existing board. However, this vote should be undertaken carefully. Only the ephori may remove a board member. Serving the Garousia directly are the aediles, called supervisors. The Garousia sets policy, the aediles are tasked with executing it. Most cities usually only have one or two aediles. The aediles interact first with the quaestors, the foremen who have proven themselves to be capable and worthy of some small authority, and then the iron, the associates who are barely out of their embrace and have yet to prove themselves, but they're trying. Somewhat outside the official clan structure are the peerage and the various social clubs. Those ventru who don't wish to partake in global politics but still maintain their sterling reputations may join the peerage, a collection of ventru with respectable dignitas. Side by side with the peerage are the various clubs a ventru might join formally or informally. Most notable among these clubs are the chess clubs. Ventru adore chess as a test of strategic capability, and a talented player may even earn some dignitas through their victories. Some Ventru may even take their chess game into the real world. These Olympians choose a mortal challenge and pit them against the champions of clanmates in a type of clan-only symbol duel. How to play Having covered history and structure, now let's focus on how to play a Ventru. First off, Ventru aren't tyrants, not unless something has gone horribly wrong. A wise Ventru recognizes that sharing power and building up one's vassals is a better move long term than simply hoarding power. Ventru seek influence, not control. They recognize the terrible power that humans can wield as a group, and so are wary of institutions like the federal government. This wariness, of course, doesn't necessarily stop them, they just step lightly. First, Ventru must secure two things, a safe place to spend their days, and a safe group of kine on which to feed, haven, and herd. Once their immediate needs are seen to, a Ventru then focuses on that which will bring them the most dignitas, money, and power. Ventru respect money, those who have it and those who earn it. Ventru are nothing without cash and no Ventru would ever admit to being unable to afford luxury. When it comes to power, Ventru favor local over state or national. And even when dealing with local powers, they tend not to target the mayor or the police chief. Instead, they cultivate assistants, paper pushers and underlings, those who can really get things done and who can adjust policy or change the priority of a file with just the nudge of a pencil. A Ventru is also shaped by his or her feeding flaw, which is usually settled within their first few nights of unlife, as their sire takes them hunting until the new vampire finds a vessel which just feels right. Many Ventru don't even perceive this as a flaw, but instead another sign of their greater refinement. That being said, most Ventru take pains to disguise their preferred stock. When hunting, Ventru have a subtle knowledge as to if a particular kind fulfills their requirements or not. As a neonate, you are likely an iron or perhaps a quaestor within the clan. Many neonates maintain close connections with their sires, serving as their vassals. Other neonates have attached to unrelated Ventru and work for them instead. Either way, every neonate should have a liege to which they are answerable. The challenge for a neonate is to establish their reputation against a backdrop of more prominent and entrenched elders. Neonates, then, tend to focus on emerging markets, somewhere they can get in on the ground floor. Players of neonates should focus their spends on backgrounds. Influence, resources, retainers, and mentor are particularly appropriate. However, Players of Venture Neonates should recognize that their ability to influence clan policy is extremely limited. Their best angle is to cultivate a liege who will listen to them and pass their ideas on to others. Ancilla are usually quaesters, with a few standouts becoming a deal, and some particularly lucky, talented, or nepotistic Ancilla being appointed tribune. Still beholden to the whims of their elders, it behooves them to cultivate neonates as their allies or even vassals. And Scylla should focus on specialization and become the master of one thing. A sphere of influence, a discipline, or even something more abstract, 
like being the social butterfly, the lore keeper, or the cleaner. Elders are certainly part of the peerage, and while many tribunes, lictors, and grousia are elders, not every elder seeks global recognition. Elders are the local leaders and should be proactive when devising objectives for the clan to work on as a whole. Elders should additionally seek to cultivate their own stable of loyal vassals and should be picky about which city offices they pursue and accept. France is obviously a good target, as is Seneschal, Keeper of Elysium, Harpy, or Archon. Elders should be aware of their own privilege and jealously guard any assault or insult to their dignitas. They've been around for centuries and have every right to expect respect and deference from the younger clan members. Sabat Ventru are a breed apart from their Camarilla brethren. The Anti-Tribu are more than the descendants of malcontents. They are a separate bloodline entirely. Ventru of the Sabat remember the time in which Ventru led by force of arms, and nobility didn't mean wealth, but victory in battle. As such, the Anti-Tribu reject many of the indolences of the parent clan, including the global hierarchy and Hardestadt's other innovations. This isn't to say that Spot Ventru aren't leaders, they certainly are, but a Ventru anti-tribu prefers to lead from the front into battle and practice the chivalric values of bravery, piety, generosity, and hope. Within the context of the Sabbat, of course. Important Ventru. Lastly, let's cover a few Ventru of note to the clan. Hardestadt is the name which nearly every vampire, kindred and canite alike, knows as the founder of the Camarilla. The most members of the inner circle are kept secret, there is no way Hardishtat doesn't influence that body, either directly or indirectly. He stays in Europe, dividing his time between Germany and Italy. While Hardishtat remains aloof from most of the night-to-night -night business of the clan in Camarilla, his child, Jan Petersoon, is his recognized agent and sent across the globe to fulfill his sire's demands. Lucinde is the current Ventru Justicar, who earned her dignitas largely by hunting down enemies of the Camarilla. A former lover of then Ventru Justicar Michaelis, she discovered a dire secret in the 1930s. Michaelis had been killed, and a follower of Set had assumed his identity, yes, as Ventru Justicar. This discovery led to the development of the Red List, the anathema of the Camarilla, and their top ten most wanted. Mithras was an ancient of the fourth generation who ruled Britain as a god-king a thousand years before the advent of Christianity. He went to Torpor sometime during the fifth century, only waking up when the blood shed during the Norman conquest of 1066 woke him up. A rival of Hardestadt's, he came to the Camarilla only reluctantly. Mithras enjoyed the worship and adoration of mortals, and had no wish to rule from the shadows. However, he eventually saw which way the wind blew, and acceded. He was driven back into Torpor during World War II, and woke only to be diabolized by an 11th generation Asimite. Rumor has it that the Diablery hasn't sat well with that Asimite. Perhaps one night Mithras may rise again. Bindusara, a Ventru from India, departs from the traditional stereotype and spends his time in occult study. Rather than motivated by a lust for power, Bindusara hungers for knowledge and enlightenment, which has taken him into many strange corners of the world. Queen Anne is the undisputed ruler of London, a woman of iron will who rules firmly but fairly. She began as Prince Pro Tem after Mithras's torpor in the mid-twentieth century, but when his death was confirmed in the nineties, she now rules the city in her own right. Somewhat departing from venture tradition, Queen Anne has invested a lot of her personal power in Parliament, though she remains circumspect and careful when wielding this influence. Her German counterpart is Prince Wilhelm Waldberg of Berlin. In the late 90s, Waldberg, the Prince of West Berlin, struggled with his sire, Gustav Breidenstein, the Prince of East Berlin, after the reunification of Germany. Taking advantage of his sire suffering a mysterious blood curse in 1997, Prince Waldberg quickly asserted control over all of Berlin, 
becoming another powerhouse amongst the kindred and ventru of Europe. Oddly enough, Prince Waldberg has become something of an expert in the mysterious Cathayans. Many young and rebellious Quasian view Berlin as something of a tourist destination, and the canny prince is careful to use his powers of the blood to reinforce that attitude among the Quasian he catches, causing them to send even more of their comrades to Berlin, and allowing Prince of Waldberg to increase his knowledge of these otherwise unknown Asian vampires. Wow, that was a lot. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. The Ventru are a complicated clan, with a lot of history and hierarchy to play. The majority of the information in this video came from the Ventru clan book, which is a solid resource for anyone looking to play a Ventru, and you can buy it at drivethroughrpg.com. Feel free to leave your questions in the comments section, and I'll see you soon as I start to cover the history and legacy of Clan Tremere. The individual. <coughs> Gerousia? 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 They need a pronunciation guide. Oh my god, that took forever.